if you're finding that your base paints are giving you clumps, lumps and bumps, or if you think it's a struggle to get them to go unevenly and you find that new coats lift old coats as you paint, then I've got some solutions for you and the best news of all is they're completely free. Well, except one of them. Now it's absolutely no secret at this point that base paints, especially Corax White, can be really hard to manage. But there is a knack to them and once you know it, I honestly feel like they're one of the best things since sliced bread. The real issue is that they don't really behave like other paints and so they can be a bit unintuitive, which leads to issues using them. So I want to take some time to explain how I figured out to handle them to counteract some of those issues and hopefully that's going to help you fall in love with them as much as I have. However, before we get into that, with the help of some pretty crap mouse drawing, let's illustrate just how these issues occur first. Okay, so first of all, imagine that you've just painted a layer of, say, Corax White onto a surface, and you're about to paint your second layer on over the top of it. As we apply our second layer of paint, there are these really heavy particles of pigment in that medium moving around a lot. And they're particularly heavy in base paints, which is what tends to cause them to solidify in the, frankly, quite badly designed GW pots. Now, I do have a solution to that as well, which I've added as a bonus later, so keep watching and you'll find out about that. Now, because that pigment is so heavy and so rough, if it hasn't fully dried when you start laying it down with a fresh layer, then what can happen is it can actually catch on itself and start to lift and shift and cause problems. This catching can then result in either a thin spot being created, which is what's going to give you that look of patchiness, or you can get a piece that was virtually dry actually be lifted, deposited back on top of that wet paint, and then you get one of those knobbly, bobbly, gobbly little clumpy bits that look ugly. So the solutions to these issues are actually threefold. First of all, proper thinning. And you can see if you look at my palette here, I have my base paints way thinner than you would think. The implied wisdom is that with a base paint, you're trying to get solid, completely flat coverage quickly. And so the kind of natural mental leap there is that you want to apply these fairly thickly, as thickly as you can get away with, really. And that's actually not the case. Base paints cover brilliantly, even when they're super, super thin. You still want to be aiming for two or three coats. They're just going to give you a super flat, solid, good surface to paint on top of. The second solution is application. It's really important to try to paint with very deliberate strokes where you're not constantly going back over the same area lots and lots of times. Using very rushed, random and busy strokes is really one of the main contributors to causing these paints to lift up. And it's generally good practice for your painting anyway to get used to making deliberate strokes and putting the brush where you want it to go. I understand that that might sound like an easy for you to say kind of solution, but it is just a thing that you can practice. Just slow yourself down a little bit, and before you start aggressively attacking the miniature with paint, just think about what direction you can go in to get the paint onto the area you're trying to paint in as few strokes as possible. And the last solution is thorough drying, and this is probably the most important one, to the extent that I actually keep a hairdryer by my hobby desk. Now obviously I paint every single day, and a hairdryer helps with drying primers, it helps with drying particularly fluid things like oil washes or contrast paints, but one of the things that I tend to find that I use it for the most is making sure that base paints are really thoroughly dried, because any amount of wetness in them is going to help contribute to that lifting issue. Now the problem with base paints is that they can look dry on the surface and still be tacky underneath. And now a lot of that is because that pigment is so thick and so dense that you don't really get an impression of what's going on all the way through the layer of paint. So a hairdryer is a really good safeguard tool here just to help make sure that you get those paints properly, properly dried. And as a little aside here, a great way to help your base paints is to actually de-bottle them or re-bottle them into 20ml dropper bottles with some agitator beads and have them pre-thinned. So what I do here is just drop in a bit of airbrush thinner into the actual paint itself, shake it around, decant it into the bottle, throw in some stainless steel agitator beads, stick the cap on, and then I've got pre-mixed, pre-thinned, ready-to-go base paints that I don't have to mess around with before I start using them. And this just takes a bit of the, the arsake going forward out of having to do something different every time. It makes them more similar in usage to the rest of your paints, because you haven't got to spend that extra time getting the consistency just so, and making sure that that clogginess in the bottle has all been 
sort of mixed back together because you actually tackled that with the rebottling process. But whether you're intending to put them through an airbrush, build them up thinly, and then go in with some brushwork over the top of that, or whether you're just trying to lay down some really nice smooth even coats so that like me you can dog pile them with way too much oil wash. Base paints can be an absolutely brilliant tool just with a few tiny adjustments to how you use them. So if you decide to give these tips a go out of curiosity or out of a want to prove me wrong, let me know in the comments if the things that I've shown you here today help you get on with these paints any better. As always, if you like the video, do click that thumbs up button. And of course, you can subscribe to the channel. You can enable notifications and all that if you want to stay up to date on what I'm doing here on YouTube. If you love the content and want to support its creation, check out the Patreon link in the description with tiers starting from about a pound a month. That's all from me for this one. So I'm going to get out of here and roll those end credits. But thank you so much for watching, everyone. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.